Hello! Today, in Critical Thinking in the Modern Age, we will be going through Chapter 1 of this course, and we're going to be looking at how to ask the right questions. So, before we get to the questions, let's talk about how we think. Um, there's four kinds of thinking that we engage in in a regular basis. The first kind is ritual thinking. These are things that we do without being aware, such as driving to work or school, tying our shoes, brushing our teeth, things that we've done so many times, they're automatic. Then we have random thinking, which is our daydreaming or spontaneous thoughts, such as imagining your wedding before you find someone to actually marry you. Um, random thinking can be anything from fantasizing about someone or thinking about a vacation or just imagining what you're even going to have for lunch. Then we have appreciative thinking and this is the awareness that we like something such as seeing an attractive person or seeing a particularly good looking hamburger or um, a car that we think is really nice and again you know these are the kinds of thinkings that they just kind of pop in and out of our head. Then we get to the fourth kind, which is critical thinking, and this is conscious thinking. This is an objective analysis and evidence evaluation of an issue in order to form a judgment. So if someone says to you they need help solving a problem at their job and they're going to give you the circumstances, they're asking you to look at the facts, evaluate them, and give an objective analysis. So this critical thinking is really what we look at in terms of that higher order executive thinking. Critical thinking involves two distinct processes. Uh, first, we need a credible source with credible information. And this can oftentimes be the most challenging part because the definition of credible is in some ways in the eye of the beholder. Um, someone who is very, very conservative will look at Fox News as being very credible. Somebody who is more progressive or liberal will see Fox News as a uh, very unreliable source for information. So there's a lot of information that we bring to the table with us that determines how we filter information, whether it's credible or not. The other aspect is we have to ana analyze this information to determine if it is clear, accurate, precise, consistent, relevant, reasonable, and fair. These are the elements that we need to assess in order to determine the true credibility in the sense of being as objective as you can. And we're going to go through this in more detail as we go through the semester. But this is what we have to do in order to really feel comfortable with material. So let's go over the characteristics of a critical thinker. First and foremost, they're open-minded. When you hear something or uh, someone tells you some information, do you automatically discount what they're saying? Or do you believe that it is potentially uh, true and that you just want to be able to verify the facts? So if somebody says to you, for example, that the moon landing in 1968 never actually happened, well, you can be open-minded, but, you know, if you know the evidence, you can also say, nope, this is actually uh, proven that it actually happened. But again, you know, you bring your own hopes, dreams, aspirations to anything. So a lot of people who are open-minded maybe are too open-minded. And we'll talk about that also. You have to be honest with yourself and you have to be willing to admit when you're wrong. Admitting that you're wrong does not make you a bad person, a stupid person, or any other negative uh, value that you can apply. It just means that you were wrong. It's like playing Jeopardy with the TV at home. You know, you're shouting out answers and sometimes you're wrong. Sometimes you're right. You know, and then you laugh when you're wrong and you give a triumphant high five to yourself when you're right. But you have to be honest about it. Courage to take initiative. The worst thing 
compared to failure is not trying. If you don't try, you'll never succeed. If you don't try, you'll never be successful. If you don't try, you'll never fail. So you have to try in order to gamble on that risk that you will succeed or you will fail. Are you willing to confront problems and meet challenges? Are you aware of your own biases and prejudices? Most of us, whatever biases and prejudices we carry around with us, were instilled in us by our family by the time we were six or seven years old. So if you grow up in a household where mom and dad don't like a particular race or religion, you're going to parrot that information because the two most important people in your life are your mom and dad. And consequently, it's not till you're older do you see those statements as potentially being prejudicial. And at that point, you make the decision to embrace that particular prejudice or reject that particular prejudice. Can you take constructive criticism from others? Or are you the type of person who's going to defend yourself in every single way? So if somebody says to you, hey, you need to work on how you use commas in your essays, do you tell them that they're stupid and they don't know what they're talking about, especially if this is your English teacher? Or do you maybe go home, look up some comma rules, and realize that you were making a mistake? And are you willing to disagree and argue your point of view with facts? So, for example, if you're a big supporter of a political candidate that a lot of people think is an idiot, are you willing to stand up and say, no, he's not, or no, she's not, and this is what she's done? You can't just say, that's my opinion, and that be the end of it. If you want to engage in debate, you must have facts to support your position. On the right-hand side at the bottom is one of my all-time favorite quotes on the internet, Um, and it's Abraham Lincoln saying, don't believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a picture with a quote next to it. And obviously this is a satire because Abraham Lincoln died in 1865, which was a good 130 years before the internet was made available to the public. Questions to ask when you are reading or listening to anything. This is going to help you be a better critical thinker. Why does someone want me to believe something? And there's an old saying, you follow the money. Almost always, almost, not always, but almost always, somebody who's trying to convince you to do something, it's about money and them making money. Whether it's a small time kind of situation where... Um, there is someone trying to sell you windows from your front door to those emails and uh, snail mail envelopes you get trying to have you buy things through them. Every time you watch a commercial, they want you to buy something. Every time you see a plea from a charity, they want your money. So, you know, ask yourself, why do they want me to believe this? Also, what were the potential problems with what is being said? Are there inconsistencies? These inconsistencies really do, to a large extent, identify potential issues. Additionally, how do I evaluate this information? Can I fact check it? Can I assess this? Is the information reasonable and can I form my own opinion? A lot of times, we hear things and they don't sound right. And this is when you should pull out your cell phone or go on the internet through your tablet, laptop, desktop, anything else you've got going on there and see if you can find information that either validates or rejects what you've been hearing. So here we have two experts who are saying completely opposite or close to opposite statements. You have Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is the director of the Hayden Planetarium, which is part of the American Museum of Natural History, where Tyson founded the Department of Astrophysics in 1997. He holds degrees from Harvard, University of Texas at Austin, and Columbia University. And clearly that means he's a slacker. So he says, people say save the Earth. No, 
Don't worry about the Earth. Earth will be here long after we render ourselves extinct. What happens is we're changing the climate faster than our culture may be able to respond. So get ready for that. It's going to redraw the maps of our world. So clearly he believes that climate change is occurring and that the earth will eventually rebound. But in the meantime, those of us humans may not be able to adapt and survive. Now on the right hand side, we have a Freeman Dyson, who is a retired professor of physics at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, where he worked with Feynman, who's the equivalent of Albert Einstein in terms of Americans, on the unification theory of quantum electrodynamics. And he holds degrees from Cambridge, which is in England, and Cornell. And he says, I am saying that all predictions concerning climate are highly uncertain. In other words, He's saying, I don't know, I can't say one way or the other. These are both very well respected experts in their field. And that leads to the next question. Which one is correct? To figure this out, one must engage in critical thinking. The basis of critical thinking is asking critical questions. And it's not always easy to determine who is right. The research you do will help you understand which expert is closest to your value system. So, for example, uh, people who tend to follow um, Neil deGrasse Tyson tend to point to the fact that in every country other than the United States, the vast majority of scientists believe that climate change is occurring and that it is having a significant impact on the world. If you stay in the United States, there are a few scientists, and not a lot, who say climate change is a naturally occurring phenomenon that humans have no impact over. So again, you have to do your own research to figure out which one is closest to your set of um, values that you hold, which nobody can define but you. So what are values? They are often unstated ideas that people see as worthwhile. They provide standards of conduct by which we measure the quality of human behavior. And we also tend to surround ourselves with friends and family who share the same values. So, you know, down at the bottom here, we see a list of values, um, the ones that are uh, really standing out, things like teamwork, respect, honesty, service, community, commitment, professionalism, excellence, integrity. Those are all values that we as Americans tend to va value very, very highly. And we measure people by how well they meet these particular aspects. Um, loyalty, independence, those kinds of qualities are things that we see as heroic. Whereas dishonesty, disrespect, and uh, disloyalty are all seen as values we don't respect. So the question then is, do you yourself value critical thinking? And how do you know? Well, there's four values that a person who values critical thinking generally recognizes and more importantly tries to instill in themselves. First, we have autonomy, which is another word for saying independent. Are you willing to forge your own path and be your own person? Make your own choices, not succumb to peer pressure? Curiosity. Are you the type of person who asks questions about topics they are learning about? A curious individual will never be bored because there is always something to learn. Humility. And this is understanding that no matter how smart you are, we all make mistakes and it confronts, uh, forces us to confront our own biases. So we have to be willing to admit you make mistakes and I make mistakes. And once you can admit you make a mistake, you can learn from those mistakes. And that's really the key here is are you willing to learn from your mistakes? Lastly, respect for good reasoning. We are surrounded by people who want to influence us for a variety of reasons, but we need to be alert for good reasoning versus false reasoning. 
So, for example, if you're pregnant or your girlfriend is pregnant, wife, whomever, um, and you say, somebody says, oh, is she going to breastfeed? Or if you're a woman, are you going to breastfeed? And they say, no, I hadn't thought about it. Why? And they say, well, it improves the immune system of the baby. It allows their um, digestive system to form naturally. And it also enhances the bond between mother and child. Those are all good reasons. Now, if on the other hand, you say, well, if you don't breastfeed, you're a bad mom. Well, the fact of the matter is, there are just some moms who want to breastfeed but cannot for some physical problem that they may be having. And consequently, that doesn't mean that they're a bad mom. It just means they're unable to do this. So that would be false reasoning. So let's look at some of the barriers to critical thinking. And you have to ask yourself, is this stuff that I do on a regular basis? You know, we all do this once in a while because it's just shortcut in our thinking. But overall, you have to ask yourself, is this something that I'm doing a lot? First, egocentrism, self-centered thinking. It's all about you. If it works for you, then that's the only important thing. Alternatively, we have sociocentrism, which is that group-centered thinking, um, which is like peer pressure. You're conform, you're pressured to conform. And I love this cartoon. You know, all these people are wearing T-shirts that say "Be yourself," and then there's a guy over here who's shirtless, and they're all complaining that he's a non-conformist. So there's a little irony in all of that. Another one, and this is a very frequent or commonly occurring one. And it's called unwarranted assumptions. Beliefs that are presumed to be true without adequate evidence or justification. Most often seen in stereotypes. So we see this guy in the red shirt out on the street. He's got big boots. He's got the tattoos. He looks kind of scary. And then you see him in his work clothes. He's in a... Uh, white lab coat he's got a stethoscope and again the idea here is you can't tell a book by its cover necessarily and you shouldn't judge people by one aspect then we have wishful thinking which is believing that something is true because one wishes it were true um, this is like wishing that you would win the lottery even though you never buy a lottery ticket it's just kind of absurd. You have to be realistic. And if you're going to set a goal, you have to have the steps to achieve that goal. Relativistic thinking is believing that the truth is just a matter of opinion, which is absolutely false. There are some truths that are absolute. The sun will rise, the sun will set. It's not just an opinion that the sun may rise. There's also something called cultural relativism, and this is the principle regarding the beliefs, values, and practices of a culture from the viewpoint of that culture itself. You know, as Americans, we know that the United States is the best country on earth. Well, weirdly enough, when you go to somewhere like Sweden or Norway, they think they're the best country on earth. The cartoon on the right-hand side there um, is a woman she has got herself in a bikini and she is saying everything is covered but her eyes what a cruel male dominated culture and then the woman on the right in the burqa is saying nothing is covered but her eyes what a cruel male dominated culture and essentially this is saying you know it's everything is from our perspective from our bias so in the united states we see a woman at the beach in a bikini and that's totally normal Whereas we see someone in a burqa at the beach and we're thinking, really? Why? Um, and then, you know, go to Saudi Arabia and the woman in the bikini would probably be stoned to death for wearing that out in public. So it's all very relative. Then we have subjectivism, which is the doctrine that objective truth does not exist. Rather, truth is a matter of what one experiences for oneself. And that, again, is that relativistic thinking that the truth is just a matter of opinion, and it's not. 
So here are some good strategies to use during an argument. And when I say argument, I'm not talking about arguing with someone that you love who didn't do the dishes or take out the trash. These are techniques to use in a situation where it's not necessarily based on a relationship that involves love. You know, because when, when you get into love relationships, common sense, critical thinking, all of that stuff goes out the window. So first thing you want to do is clarify your understanding of what the other person's intentions are by asking, did I hear you say blah, 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 blah. Again, when you clarify what you hear so that you truly understand what they're saying, they can sometimes understand that what they're saying sounds like complete ridiculousness. Second, ask the other person whether there is any evidence that would cause him to change his mind. And the reason for this is studies have demonstrated that the more dogmatic a person is, and dogmatic means convinced of their own superiority in terms of a particular issue, the less chance they will change their mind even if presented with compelling evidence. So you know, there's still a lot of people out there who think that vaccinations have something to do with autism. And despite the fact there is zero evidence connecting the two, they believe it without the evidence. And, you know, usually what you see is the less evidence out there, the more dogmatic they're going to be. Number three, suggest a timeout in which each of you will try to find the best evidence for the conclusion you hold. If you end up in a argument about something and let's say the political candidates for president or whether or not the deal for the Iran uh, nuclear deal is a bad one or a good one, say, you know what, let's take 15 minutes, look up what we find, and then we'll come back together and talk about it. Lastly, ask why the person thinks the evidence on which you are relying is so weak. Um, again, oftentimes people will be full of bombastic, loud argument, but they don't really have many facts. So if you walk into an argument and you have the facts and they're not listening to you, ask them, why are you not listening to the facts? And sometimes they'll have a reasonable argument and sometimes they'll say, well, that's just what I believe in. If you go back to the previous slide, just because it's your opinion doesn't mean it's true. You can also try to find common ground. If you take that person's best reasons and put them together with your best reasons, is there some conclusion that both of you could embrace? Compromise is not a dirty word. And, you know, sometimes you just have to agree to disagree, but other times you can see each other's points. Number six, search for common values, uh, other shared conclusions to serve as a basis for determining where the disagreement first appeared in your conversation. Number seven, try to present a model of caring and calm curiosity. As soon as the verbal heat is turned up, remember that you're a learner, not a warrior. So you're not trying to decimate their argument, you're trying to understand their argument. And then if their argument is ridiculous, you can give them information demonstrating that their argument is not sound. Last on this page, number eight, make certain your face and body suggest humility rather than the demeanor of a know-it-all. So again, what you're looking for here is not to be a pompous, pretentious jerk, but rather somebody who wants to learn and grow and express themselves in a reasonable way. So let's talk about what weak sense critical thinking is. This is the use of critical thinking to defend your current beliefs, but you're not listening to another's. The purpose of this is to resist and annihilate opinions and reasoning differ than your own. So if you are as dogmatic about a subject that you're not going to listen to the other person's perspective, this may be critical thinking, but it's a weak sense critical thinking and you know at least initially you should always walk into a discussion with an open mind and then realize the person is full of BS. 
Now, on the other hand, we have what's called strong sense critical thinking. And this is the use of critical thinking to evaluate all claims and beliefs, especially one's own. The purpose of this is to protect ourselves against self-deception and conformity. It will allow us to strengthen our beliefs because they have been rigorously tested. If we can validate our own perceptions, beliefs, and values in a rational way, then we can feel good about the fact that our beliefs have been tested and we still believe in them. This will become more apparent as we go through the chapters and you see more and more examples of this. So that finishes up chapter one. If you have any questions, please email or text me. Otherwise, I hope you have a great day and uh, enjoy the rest of this glorious morning.